Isn't it great to know our God is fighting for us? I, I love that realization. What a, what a great thought to carry with you. And um, But we are not alone. We are not alone. And Satan loves when he can make us feel alone. And um, that's just, uh, we're setting ourselves up uh, for his work uh, when we start thinking that way. We are not alone. Good morning. <laughs> Good to be with you today and uh, share with you in worship. And we're continuing our series of, of bearing fruit as we focus on the fruit of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and uh, letting the fruit of the Spirit uh, become a consistent part of our lives uh, each and every day. Uh, this morning, uh, if you brought your Bibles, that's great. And uh, you can open those to uh, the passages that will uh, appear. And uh, this morning, if you're using the, uh, the Life Version app, uh, you can uh, open that up and follow along. All the scriptures are printed there for you, uh, all the points in the message, and um, spaces for you as well if you want to add some notes to that. There are some instructions of getting into the Version app at the very bottom of the back page. So I uh, just want to let you uh, be aware of that this morning. And to welcome each of you uh, here this morning, and to welcome those joining us on Facebook Live this morning. And we're so glad that you're here uh, sharing worship with us as well, at least watching us in worship. And uh, we're so glad that you're a part of this today. Uh, we're looking at joy today, and in reading the Bible, there is, um, there is a lot of joy and rejoicing that are very central to the people of God that we find throughout the Bible. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Jewish encyclopedia Kaufman Kohler states that no language has as many words for joy and rejoicing as the Hebrew language. In the Old Testament, there are 27 different words that are used for some aspect of joy or joyful participation in worship to God. And Jewish worship was essentially a joyous proclamation and celebration. And a Jew saw the act of thanking God as the supreme joy in his or her life. Pure joy is joy in God as both its source and its object. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 1611, You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. You will fill me with joy in your presence. The Old Testament, it's very central moving through that. But also we find in the New Testament, it also stresses joy. In 1 Thessalonians, we're commanded to be joyful always. Romans 12 says that we should be joyful in hope. And in Philippians 4, we're told to rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. You know, sometimes I read that and I, I wonder why did, why did Paul repeat himself there, you know? Uh, why did he feel it necessary to say more than just rejoice in the Lord always and then tack on the end, I will say it again, rejoice. And normally when we repeat things in multiple times it's because we want that message to be seen in a great importance. You know those times when you tell your kids something twice because you know it's important and you want them to know it's important? Or your grandkids or the kids you're working with back in kids' worship or wherever you happen to be with kids. But, you know, it's just some of those things we just say, we say in multiple times. And, and Paul was wanting us to realize that joy is very important to God and it needs to be important to those of us who want to become like Jesus. Our mission is to become like Jesus. And so joy needs to be a very important part of who we are as a people. The Bible says that God wants us to experience joy. And joy is often defined as a, a deep and, and, and constant sense of well-being. A deep and constant sense of well-being that undergirds all of life. We read in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. At the very end of that, as is, is Paul is writing these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's just simply saying all of these great things 
no one would want to end them with any kind of a law. I mean, they are just welcome in every circle of life that we are in. And so, against such things, there is no law. But reading that passage and knowing that joy is a fruit of the Spirit, do you still find yourself saying things like, you know, if I'm a Christian, and the fruit of God's Spirit living in me is joy, why don't I feel more joyful? Why does my attitude hit rock bottom so often? What is joy all about anyway? And where can I get some? Well, today, God's Word does provide some answers to those questions. But I think a lot of times when we read Bible passages about joy, we get a little confused. Because it just doesn't match up with what we expect to read. For instance, in James 1, 2 through 4, James wrote, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. The Apostle Paul wrote later in 2 Corinthians 7, 4, he said, In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. You know, both of those statements are not what the average person expects to see as a formula for joy. You know, James says that we said actually rejoice when we are going through trials because trials make us strong. And Paul says that despite his numerous problems, and Paul had a lot of difficulties, certainly after he became a follower of Christ and sought to live for Christ, but he lists several times in some of his letters just some of the hardships that he went through because of his faith. There were times he went without water. There was times he went without food. He was persecuted. He spent time in prison. He was, he was shipwrecked. and You know, you just begin reading all these things. How many times he was beaten? And Paul said, despite all that stuff, his joy was beyond measure. You know, those statements, when I read them, suggest to me that God's definition of joy must be different from what most people would say. And so it's important to turn to God's word today and allow him to lead us to joy. I'm using the points on the back of your bulletin. If you have that open today, if you're a new version, you have those already. But first of all, happiness and joy are not the same thing. Happiness and joy are not the same thing. Many people think that joy and happiness is pretty much the same thing, but there is a critical distinction between the two. Happiness is based on outward circumstances. Those physical things that that um, bring us comfort. Those physical things that please us. Those those outward circumstances, and we all have those things. You know, there's places you like to be, there's things you like to be doing, you kind of like how things are, and when you get to that spot, you would probably say, yeah, I'm happy about this. That's happiness. It's based on what's going on around us and and what makes us happy and what makes us comfortable. But by nature, these things come and go. And sometimes they come and go pretty quickly. Maybe you had those days that, that started out absolutely great, but some point in the day, it's like all the wheels fell off. You know, everything wrong that you think had happened goes wrong. And it happened really quick. Maybe you've had some of those days when it started horrible and it got a lot better. I hope you've had some of those days as well. But by nature, these outward circumstances that often we have little control over can come and go pretty quickly. Happiness depends on pleasurable circumstances. But you know, in the Bible, God never promised that when we became his follower that we would always be happy. The words happy and happiness appear only 27 times 
in the entire new international version of the Bible. 27 times, happy and happiness. But the words joy and rejoice are found 320 times. And so just the use of some terminology kind of lets us know what is really more important to God, joy and rejoicing, than happy and happiness. Joy may be a very uh, distant cousin of happiness, but it's definitely not the same thing. Happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is based on a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we have an authentic relationship with Jesus, our joy remains regardless of our circumstances. Peter says about Jesus, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. An inexpressible and glorious joy. Peter is saying that even though we can't see Jesus in, in physical form today, walking around like we look at each other, even though we can't see him, we know he's there. And we love him because he loves us and he gave his life for us and he promises to bring us to heaven one day. And because we have that kind of relationship with him that doesn't change, doesn't go away day to day, because we have this daily relationship with him, we are filled with joy. You know, salvation is not just what happened when we gave our lives to Jesus. Salvation means that we have daily forgiveness of our sins. Hallelujah. I am so glad that the blood of Jesus covers my sins each day. Because I sin. And I certainly am grateful for that. And, and this continues... And we know that salvation also means that one day we'll enjoy a home in heaven. And it's going to be fantastic. We can't even find the right amount of words in the, to really talk about what it's going to be to be there. And so because of these things, salvation has a present sense, but it also has a very strong future sense but Satan wants to take that away from you even if just mentally day by day and so he wants you to believe that those sins that you continue to commit are really what define you that you're really just a weak pathetic creature that brings dishonor to God and you know, he really doesn't want you around. You're just such a loser. And too often, I think we buy his pack of lies and we start looking at our, our failures and the sin we still commit. And you say, oh, you know, you're right. I, I just can't beat this thing. and I just still struggle with this. And I, I wish it'd go away. And it just doesn't. And all of a sudden, we're back to focusing on our sins. And, and we're not focusing on the fact that God has forgiven those and God loves us and, and, and life moves on in a very special relationship with Him. We have received the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls, and because of that, there is an inexpressible and glorious joy that needs to be ours. Because Jesus does not see us as a pathetic loser. He sees us as precious, adopted children that he loves so much and day by day sometimes more slowly than we can realize we are being shaped into a masterpiece that he created us to be in the first place and it's a day by day change as we continue to yield to his word and practice the things we read and we link with the things the holy spirit is doing in our lives and around us and all of a sudden we're living in this joy and God is changing us, and we are a new people, and we have a new identity. 
But the reality of Christ's salvation... And the presence of the Holy Spirit in us enables us not only to endure, but to prevail in some of life's most difficult of circumstances. I mean, how does that woman in the cancer unit maintain such a bright and optimistic outlook? Well, it's not because her physical condition is so good. But it's because of her life-giving relationship with Jesus. And how did that victim of childhood sexual abuse leave the scars behind and discover once again the will to live and the ability to love? What all hinges on an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, many of us still struggle with joy even though we are in a far better circumstance than those two situations that I just mentioned. And we want to talk about that for a few minutes. Why do we struggle so much with joy? Well, that's the second point. Many people struggle with hindrances to joy. They struggle with hindrances to joy. Let me give you a few examples today. First of all, some people grew up with a lot of negativity in their childhood home. A lot of negativity. And during those years of being shaped and molded and a kind of our outlook on life, a lot of times people, because of that, that's kind of what's etched into their way of looking at life. God's word insists in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Unfortunately, many fathers... And mothers, when we were growing up, are exasperating. And you may have grown up in a negative home where there was very little positive encouragement. Nobody ever told you you did a good job. You know, maybe there was constant criticism, 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 criticism. There wasn't much laughter in your home if there was any at all. Maybe you lived a, a, a had your childhood and was in fear. Fear of the people that you should have been able to trust. But just because joy is a challenge because of a past, don't think that living in joy is an impossibility for you. You can move beyond that because joy comes as a result of a spirit-led life. It's not something you're going to manufacture yourself. It's not a past you're going to just completely forget and erase. But God's spirit will certainly lead you to a better life. There's also the issue of Hanging guilt. Hanging guilt. You know, often the guilt that we experience today as Christian people is for something that you've repented of. And you know in your mind that God has forgiven you for it, but you just can't seem to let go of the guilt. And if that is you, Remember this. If you have confessed your sin to God and you have truly repented of it, in other words, you've stopped doing it, then the guilt you're feeling is not from God. It's from Satan. He loves you to live in your past. He loves to keep playing the tapes. He loves to make you feel guilty all over again. But God, God says when you come to him, when you confess your sins, when you repent of those sins, when they're covered in the blood of Jesus, that God takes your sin and casts it into the depths of the sea and forgets it. So when you have brought those sins to God and that keeps coming up to you, realize where that guilt's coming from. And that's a voice you don't listen to. You turn to God's word and you begin to read about his love for you and what he does with our sin. And that's the reality you and I need to live in. But there's another joy stealer in guilt. 
And that is that the feeling you're having may be entirely justified. You may be living with hidden sins. Things that you have not brought out to, to deal with in your life and confessed to God and repented of those and stopped whatever you were doing. You haven't become accountable perhaps to some other people that will, will help you move beyond those things. And so Satan is loving this period in your life when you are looking holy and righteous on the outside, but in the inside you're harboring hidden sins because Satan loves hidden sin. He loves us to tuck those things so deep within ourselves and they're still a part of our life and we act like they're not. He loves that. The Bible admits that sin brings pleasure for a season, but true joy cannot coexist with a guilty conscience. Another example of things that are hindrances to us with joy are just simply lousy circumstances. Lousy circumstances. And this is probably the most common barrier to joy that people experience. You know, it's easy to be positive and pleasant when things are great with your family and great with your job and great with your health and great with your church and great with your finances. I mean, when those periods of your life, when everything is, is smelling roses and things look great, it's easy to be kind and filled with joy. And, and everybody can see that. But what happens when your teenager rebels or you lose your job or your health breaks or your small group becomes divisive or your finances crumble? Then what? I love the words in Habakkuk 3 beginning in verse 17. He wrote, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no, there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread the heights. Habakkuk is basically saying, if everything goes wrong, if everywhere I look, I don't like what's happening, I will still rejoice in the Lord. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He is my source of joy regardless of the circumstances and a lot of times in the midst of tough circumstances we need to look in his face we need to look to him and be reminded that we are loved that he is living in us in his spirit because he wants to be in a relationship with us that he has forgiven our sin that we have received the salvation of our souls. A forgiveness that continues day after day. Because we are so deeply loved. Because of the blood of Jesus. And one day, there's going to be a home in heaven. He is our source of joy. Thirdly on your outline, we serve a joyful God. We serve a joyful God. Do you realize that we serve a joyful God? <laughs> I think a lot of people think of his holiness and his power and his wisdom and his love. But if you were sitting and ask a group of people words to describe God, I doubt very few people would say he's joyful. Because that's just not always our focus. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 said these words, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Did you ever think of God singing? Thought probably never crossed your brain, didn't mind it this week. But this verse talks about God 
rejoicing over you was singing. That not only does God sing, but God sings because you bring him joy. Have you ever really thought about that? You know, God's not up there beating you up like you beat up yourself. God's up there looking at you as his prized children, his adopted children, his loved children, that he is working for our good, even in the midst of some very difficult circumstances. And he is so, so excited and so joyful over us that he's singing. What a picture. But you know, Jesus modeled a joyful life as well. He was certainly serious at times and needed to be, and he was never flippant about important things. But Jesus always radiated joy. He just seemed to take so much in stride and, and had a perspective about life that probably seemed so elusive to most of us. His contagious personality attracted other people. You figure his first miracle came at a wedding feast, a party. And in sermons and teaching, he told jokes, he used humor. Maybe not the type of humor we use today. But people laughed when Jesus taught, preached. And then you think about the night before he died. His enemies were closing in. Judas had already sold him out. And when he came into the Last Supper, his disciples were arguing about who was the most important of their group. And he was about to be condemned and murdered for the sins of the whole world. Boy, what a downer. But you know, even then, even then, Jesus talked to his disciples about joy. Look in John 15, beginning in verse 9. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. Does that seem like the thing he'd be talking about at the time like that? Well, it is when you know who Jesus is. Because joy was not an up and down thing with him. It was a constant. It's part of his nature. It's character traits that are there in Jesus. And he wants us to have as well. But you know, not only do we see joy in God the Father and God the Son, the Holy Spirit transfers that joy to us. The fruit of the Spirit, the product of God's Spirit within us is joy. When we come to Christ, we're given the Holy Spirit, and we know that in that gift is joy and love and all of these other things that we read about in, in the Scriptures. The Apostle Paul told the church in Thessalonica, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Where did that joy come from? The Spirit of God. of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Dr. Leori Lawson wrote a book called God's Way to a More Perfect You. And in this book, he wrote about Mrs. Miller who had a mastectomy due to cancer. And Miss Miller was a very vibrant Christian woman and she was lying on a gurney in a hospital hallway waiting to be treated, and she heard nearby a woman who was, who was crying. And she was concerned about this particular woman, and she asked her simply, what's wrong? And the woman spat back, what do you mean what's wrong? 
Look where I am. I've got cancer. And Miss Miller said, so do I. And the woman says, yes, but I had surgery for the removal of a breast, and now I've got lumps on the other side. Miss Miller said, so have I. And the woman said, but that's not all. These treatments make me violently ill. Miss Miller said, I know. Me too. And the woman said, besides all that, I'm in my 50s. And I think I'm going to die. And Miss Miller said, I think I'm going to die too. And the other woman says, well, how can you lie there so expletive peaceful? Miss Miller said, have you tried praying? And the woman said, of course I've prayed. I've gone to every church in the area. I've prayed everything from Christian scientists to Buddhists to Baptists. And you know what? None of them worked. And Miss Miller said, I know why. The woman said, you do? Why? Miss Miller said, you think your essential problem is to get rid of the cancer. But what you really need is Jesus. After some further discussion and a lot of tears, that woman asked Mrs. Miller to pray with her. And the nurses later reported a, a, a dynamic change in the woman's attitude, attitude. She was literally never the same person after that moment. And she began to learn a truth that, that you and I must discover for ourselves. Joy is never found in perfect health, happy circumstances, or an easy life. True joy can only be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to be reminded today that this fruit of the Spirit is not something we just need to will ourselves, work harder, force these things into our lives because that's what we're supposed to be. But we must be willing to work with your spirit who has brought these things to our lives if we are a Christian. But Father, I'm afraid too often we have listened to Satan's lies and we have minimized the work of the Holy Spirit. And we're not working with him. We're just hoping he'll work with us. Dear Father, we have not fully surrendered to a sovereign God and to a Savior and Lord and to walk with the Spirit. And so, Father, I pray that today we might use this opportunity to evaluate our relationship with you and commit or recommit ourselves to allowing you to lead in our lives. And so, Father, when we ask these prayers in the name of Jesus, amen. Today, if you are struggling with joy, my first question to you would be, have you fully surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Because joy comes when you make Jesus Christ first in your life. If there is something, it doesn't matter what it is in your life, that is more important to you than Jesus Christ, you have not fully surrendered to Him in your life. It was Jesus who said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I think too often we have worked simply to look good and to sound good. 
we've surrendered some things to Jesus, but we've not given him everything. He doesn't have first place. He's somewhere two or three or four down the line. And we don't have the life that God has called us to. And so I think it's really important for you and for me that we take time today to say, is Jesus Christ Lord of my life? Am I fully surrendered to him? Is he first above all things in my life? Because if Jesus is not first, you will never have joy. joy comes we are fully surrendered to him we are trusting his sovereignty we are using the gifts he's given us the abilities he's given us the time he's given us the treasure he's given us to please him not ourselves and we are sold out to him that way and we are working with him we are growing in our relationship with him we are striving to live for him every single day we are relying on his holy spirit to guide us and help us where we struggle that's when the fruit begins to be born in our lives because the Spirit is free to work because the Lord Jesus is first in our lives. This morning, if you would like to talk to someone about your relationship to Jesus, if you'd like to sit down and look at the Bible and what the New Testament calls us to to become a follower of Jesus, love to talk to you about that today if you are looking for a church family the church is jesus's idea it is here to help us grow and we that we can serve this community together if you'd like to talk about the church and becoming a part of the church i'd love to talk to you myself or anybody with the badges on that will be in the back of the room this morning if you want somebody to pray with you this morning if you're struggling joy is elusive to you you just need some help you need someone to pray with you this morning let one of us pray with you. We're more than happy to do that today. Please move to one of us as we stand together, as we sing, um, and respond to the call of the gospel today. Would you stand with me?